Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second virtual Diverse Educators event. Um, if you joined us back in June, you know that we had to flip our face-to-face -face event that was due to be in Liverpool to a virtual event, um, and we're delighted to be rejoining you today with our second event. I'm Hannah Wilson, one of the co-founders of Diverse Educators. I'm delighted that my co-founder, Benny Carla, um, is here, and we're wearing our swag. We've got our Diverse Educators t-shirts on today, and now we've got some branding and a website, so hopefully they'll be in the online shop for you all very soon. So today's event has four quarters. Um, we're going to have 45 minutes with a group of speakers, a break, and then another 45 minutes for our slots from nine to one. Our first panel is focused on the diverse children who we serve in the education system. And we are delighted to be joined by five speakers. Our first speaker is Amanda Carter Philpott, who is a trainer, educator, and campaigner for inclusivity. Our second speaker is Anton Chisholm, who is a teacher of maths and a mentor. Our third speaker is David Hermit, a Matt CEO. And then we have two speakers from our partners. We have Lisa Stevenson from the Storymakers Company, who is one of our affiliative um, partners from Leeds Beckett University. And we have Nicola Ponsford, who, Nicole Ponsford, sorry, Nick, came out wrong, who is co founder and co CEO of GEC, the Global Equality Collective. We are delighted you're here with us this morning, guys. We've got very tight time slots. So let's dive straight in. Amanda, please unmute yourself and, and, and tell us your story. Good morning, everyone. Um, as you've just been introduced, I'm Amanda. I've been working with uh, the topic of my talk, which is refugees, for about the last five years. And I'm going to break this five minutes into two bits. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the challenges that refugees face in accessing ed education here in the UK. And secondly, I'm going to look at more optimistically what we can do in planning for the future because I'm all about solutions, not issues. So to give it some context, there are more than 26 million refugees worldwide, and over half of those are children and young people who are of school age. The challenges they face mean that they are sometimes way behind with, the, with their peer groups in their host countries, one of which is the UK, of course. So these challenges, are varied but i and my list is not exhaustive but i've come up with what i think are key issues one of them is legal barriers so we've got lack of clear provision on compulsory education for children in reception centers children without residence permits or those with international protected status administrative challenges for for children young people and their families include inflexible registration deadlines residents and other personal documentation requirements which are often missing due to the journeys that, that, that they've made and having to flee their homes and insufficient information provided by local authorities to children and young families who settle here about what services are available that might be able to support them. We all know about the next one caused by our mm, austerity I'll call it very generously we have insufficient human and financial resources in our schools and education establishments due to uh, which has led to limited places in schools preschools after schools classes there's a lack of catch-up classes which many of these children need their education has been severely impacted on not just for days or weeks but for many months and for some many years um so we also need we also have insufficient guidance and training for teachers and other educational staff about some of the issues these children face and which will impact on how they receive education in, in internally um, so for example when they arrive in class many of these children have seen their homes destroyed some of them have been child soldiers many of them have made journey alone many of them have seen their families destroyed, wiped out, killed, and sometimes tortured. Their education, as I've said, will have been interrupted for months. And on top of that, they get here and they have to learn in a language which many of them are only just beginning to understand. So that's a huge challenge for them. And finally, in terms of challenges, because I've only got five minutes, stereotypes. As we know, we're all very defensive as humans about anything that we see as different. 
So children who come from uh, Syria, Somalia, those are the children and young people and families that I've mostly worked with, they often face unintended, perhaps, discrimination, prejudice and bullying. So again, that will impact on them neg negatively. Um, and I did have a little poem that one of my uh, young people wanted me to share with you about his experience of bullying, but haven't got time for that as well as all the other things I want to say to you. So planning for the future. So what can we do about all these challenges? First of all, we need to embrace the fact that the ed education is key to these children. It's key to all of our children, but particularly these children who, who have had their present lives and their past lives disrupted and want to build a better future for themselves, their families and their communities. So we all need to embrace that, particularly government policy makers, for example, who should recognise that all children, whatever their situation, are entitled to a decent education. And that that education needs to be adapted for their needs so that they can make, maximize the experience that they have. In line with that, Ofsted also, from my point of view, needs to recognize the, the great work that is going on in many schools in our country to deal with the issues that refugees bring with them. Um, some of which are nothing to do with schooling. You know, as I said, these children have had experiences that no child should ever have to experience. And that impacts on how they learn, how they receive their education. And that's before they even started to learn English. So we need high levels of pastoral care and mental health support. So teachers need training, as do other educational support staff. And of course, that costs money some of the time. Um, I've got links which I'll put in the chat later um, so you can access some of the things that I'm talking about. Um, so, for example, and I'm just referring to my notes because I don't want to leave this out. There are some, some tremendous collaborative partnerships between schools, colleges and the voluntary sector where there are many specialist staff who are used to dealing with trauma, for example. And by goodness, these kids have dealt with trauma on a huge scale. Um, so if we can foster those connections, foster those um, com communities and perhaps develop an, a mentoring system where some of those mentors can be trained that come from that child or young person's community themselves. So that lessens the language barrier and the, un, uh, and the need to uh, understand a different language while they're trying to take on board all this new stuff. Remote learning is another way. There are so there is sometimes three, maybe six months delay in children and young people accessing a place in school. Uh, and so remote learning, which we're all indulging in now, uh, is, is crucial in terms of what they can learn at home. Um, and we need creative approaches to peer support, like we had when bullying was apparently a new thing. Um, Amanda, I'm going to have to stop you there, lovely. Such an amazing start to the event. Thank you so much. A very sobering start for us today. And I think it's so important that we're starting thinking about the diverse children we're serving. We'd love you to do a blog and share some of those links and share that poem. But thank you so much for kicking us off today as My our first pleasure. speaker. I'm going, to, I'm going to pass swiftly over to Anton. Anton, if you want to unmute yourself and dive in, please. Yeah. Hiya. Thanks for having me on, Hannah. Um, I'm a maths teacher. And that's been awakened in this recent moment in, that, in time that we find ourselves um, coming to terms with my experience as in education as a black boy, relatively sensible, growing up in Birmingham. Um, I went to a majority black primary school with all black teachers. Um, I was a bit of an anomaly. Um, and then I got into grammar school where I was in the minority. And I saw firsthand how things can change in a moment. I went from being this bright, the world is your oyster student to feeling like a bit of a jigsaw piece, loose jigsaw piece, missing, um, asking where do I fit in into this society, into this world. 
So there was a problem that um, arose. I left education, looking around the room, having a bit of a lack of identity. And I was always told by my parents that I have to work twice as hard to get half as much. But that gave me a bit of an inferiority complex, made me think, okay, why do I have to work twice as hard? What do people not see in me that I see in my myself at times? And what am I going to have to prove to my teachers? And I was given the answer pretty early on in my secondary school, um, where my English teacher told me, it's not possible for you to have written this grade A star piece of work. Um, my careers advisor, who's supposed to be the one pushing me and driving me, um, was really shocked when he um, saw that I wanted to go to university. He said, I thought you'd be an evangelist or something like that. And it really, really threw me back. And just some common experiences um, that other friends and colleagues have faced, not having any black teachers in secondary school, um, the only black staff that they're seeing in the kitchen, um, staff being adept at pronouncing names like Tchaikovsky, struggling to say Omotok, and the subtle, and sometimes not so subtle, microaggressions that we faced. It really um, came, made me think um, about what are students experiencing in school? And my motivation as well um, came, came about through a report that um, came out in July this year. Um, it was a school teachers review body report that was talking about only 1% of head teachers were black. And it highlighted that black students were excluded at triple the rate of their counterparts and it really made me think if there were more black head teachers more black people in um, senior leadership in the school in education in general would that rate be as high or would these people understand those cultural um, nuances that are getting students um, in some cases unfairly excluded unfairly excluded so that made me realize representation matters okay it really does we want to be able to exist um, without having to explain ourselves now it brings me to um, a scenario where um, at a parents evening I saw a black parent talking quite passionately about their child um, and I thought nothing of it but the white teacher that was having that interaction felt the interaction was confrontational was aggressive and I compare that to um, a COVID-friendly online um, parents even that I've had recently, where a black parent um, came on the screen and saw me as a black teacher. And I could see that sense of relief in their face. It was palpable. I could sense that um, all of their teaching experiences were just coming out on, on screen. And she was just so relieved to see a, familiar, a familiarity with me and know that her daughter was going to be taught by um, a black teacher she wanted her child to feel empowered and not powerless and have that visual representation of what she could be so this just brings me on to a few solutions um, that might be possible to have we need more representation better representation in the staff body in senior leadership we need the curriculum to be more diverse, not just Black History Month um, for a month or a week in some places. And we need to cater to those students that are in front of us and teach them about that multicultural society that um, we live in from a holistic point of view, not just the view of the conqueror and build up our Black students, especially because society drags them down so much. We have to make purposeful um, effort to build them up and listen to their concerns because they're real and try not to take it personally. Okay, one of the best things that I read um, during this lockdown period um, was an open letter written by a group of students from King Edward's Campill Girls School that spoke about those problems that they faced and solutions um, that they felt were um, able to, to happen to make their experience a bit better and just always remembering that you can't be what you can't see.
So those are some of the solutions that I think will help that situation. Anton, thank you so much. That was so succinct and so powerful. You've got some amazing comments and questions from the chat. Um, and I think what, what I'm really hearing there is the student agency as well. I, I'd love to see that letter. If we could perhaps share that letter further afield to the audience, that'd be great as well. And we know the stats are dire for BAME teachers and BAME head teachers. But David, as one of our only BAME CEOs in the country, it doesn't get much better when we get to that level either. So why don't you now share a bit of your story and your thinking about diverse children? Hi, um, pleasure to be with you all. And um, it's really important that we share these experiences that are personal ones. And today I want you to share with you what we've been discovering from our children as they've come back from lockdown. And in particular, we want you to actually emphasize the differences in opinion between those children who have protected um, characteristics and those who do not. And so if I can just take you through um, our first phase really as children return from lockdown, was to look at what the educational psychologists were telling us, which is that the anxiety levels are gonna be very high. What can we do to reduce that? And we took the view that every one of our 4,100, I think, children should have a personal interview with someone. And with an adult that they trusted, we have children age three all the way up to 18. And so we wanted to ensure that they spoke to someone about just how they were feeling. And our first phase was really a truth and reconciliation phase. Uh, what we taught, said to them was, look, it doesn't really matter whether it's been good, bad or indifferent, your experience over lockdown. Just tell us how you feel. And our young people have told us about their deepest hurts. And we've been getting some of that real deep information from them directly. But like all sorts of studies like that, uh, the person that they were in front of, um, how they felt with that person would determine how much they would share. And so it's not perfect science, but it's enabled us to do some planning off the back of what they're telling us directly. Uh, we're now moving into our second phase and our second phase is to do a little bit of research. And so I'm leading on a small scale research project. Um, I'm about to retire and I retire at Christmas. As, um, and so as I move on, um, I'm going into some postdoctoral studies. Um, I wanted to start to find out exactly what students felt about common issues, but to be able to break it down by their um, protected characteristics. When people found out that I was doing this, lots of people said to me, look, hang on, Dave, are you doing this for your trust? Can we join in as well? And so I ended up having to make it open access. And so um, it's there on Twitter at David Hermit. You can find a link to it. And so the survey is out there. It's got 21 questions. 21 simple questions that we've sort of narrowed down as being the most important things that we wanted to find out about how children felt. We wanted to find out about their experience and how they felt around lockdown, before, after, returning, online learning, what's it been like for them. We wanted to find out about their emotions and about their emotional well-being and their health and their physical um, things. And I was speaking at a conference the other week. It was surprising just how many of them hadn't done any sports during lockdown. And then we also wanted to tackle some equality issues. And we really wanted to understand to what extent they felt that their school was tackling the big questions of equality like sexism, racism, and to what extent they felt that their schools could do better. And so we asked them those sorts of questions. Now, I'm sure all of you here are thinking, what did they say? Now, the survey's only just started. And so I, I, I'm not a position where I can share a lot of data, but what I did want to do was share with you just one question or one statement really that um, we asked them and it was just a simple yes, no answer. Most of the questions are on a scale of strongly agree, strongly disagree. And all we asked them was, um, my school has done a good job of supporting me during lockdown. That's all we asked. And we found at the moment about 79% of children are saying yes, they think their school has done a great job. And that's really, really enheartening for schools who are struggling with lockdown and, and all the other things that are going on. And geographically, we know that it's not easy, depending on where you are in the country, to manage schools at this time. Very stressful for school leaders. So 79% are saying yes. But then how does that change when we look at the sort of protected characteristics? So the first protected characteristics, gender. Um, when we looked at that, we found that 79% for girls, 78% for boys, 1% differential. So there's not a lot going on between boys and girls um, in our data so far. However, when we looked at ethnicity, we found a massive range, absolutely massive. We've got 100% of our Asian children saying that they felt well looked after. Um, but that drops down to around 60% for our black um, heritage children, and particularly also our mixed heritage children. 
Our white children, white British, 80% of them. So they're sort of in the middle. Um, most of our children, we're in Cheshire. Most of our children are white. We don't have a lot of children from ethnic minority or global majority backgrounds. And so what we found was that ethnicity was a big divider. Age, we found that year five and year six were the happiest, 86, 89% of those. Um, disability, 72%, so not that far away from the mean. And religion was a very interesting one that I shall finish on. And um, with religion, what we found was that atheists were at 45%. Quite a number of children wanted to identify themselves as atheists in the survey. Um, it was completely up to young people to identify their protected characteristics. Um, it's anonymous. So we don't know their names. We just know if they've um, disclosed their protected characteristics, what they meant. 84% um, for Christians, though. 84% for Christians. And um, we found also, interestingly, in the survey so far, about half the children saying that they have no religion. So lots more we're going to find out over a period of time. Um, the survey closes on the 31st of um, October. Um, we're going to take November to analyze the data. And then I'll publish the information on a blog uh, more generally for everyone. But for the individual schools within our trust, they'll get a breakdown that looks at how their school is performing against the others as a benchmark. So we think it's a useful thing to do. And I'd encourage others if they're thinking about how they can try and get data and break it down that maybe they might want to look at the survey and take what they can from it. Anyway, enough from me. Wow, David, thank you. Thank you for, for modelling what, what a trust-wide initiative can look like. And we'd love to share that far and wide for you and, and also the blog and the findings. And we're working with the Centre for Education and Youth about actually bringing some research into the website. So definitely we need to have a chat. So thank you so much for that. So now on to our first of our partners. And it's, it's great that Lisa's here from the Storymakers Company, because actually we're talking here about how we can tell the stories of the children we're teaching. So Lisa, over to you, please. Uh, hi there. Morning, everybody. Lovely to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, Storymakers Company um, for the next five minutes and specifically um, the role of stories in learning um, and what we can learn from making stories together um, and particularly how this can amplify the diverse uh, children's lived experiences. Um, so a little bit about the Storymakers Company. Um, it was started by academics, teachers, artists, all together. It's a collective um, in 2017. And it started with a real concern about the marginalization of creative opportunities for children in school, and also the value placed on creative learning through policy. One of the really exciting things about our work is we co-research with children. So we're a practice-based research center at, at Leeds Beckett University. And we really believe, as I'm sure everybody does here, that the stories we create and make, and it's the making that's really interesting and share, should celebrate diversity, promote citizenship. And by that, we mean empathy, compassion, critical questioning, ethics and critical thinking. However, we know, and I'm just going to mention three reports that were released um, last October and um, 2019, that uh, the Durham Commission, particularly into creativity, the Paul Hamlin report into creative learning and the Arts Council report, 2030 report, actually that this report engaged with over 5,000 stakeholders. Um, and they found no surprise that for many children, the opportunities to engage with arts, culture and creativity was very much dependent on their postcode. Um, and the Durham Commission actually cited this now as a social justice issue. So this is part of our work. And we may add to that the brilliant research done by the Centre for Literacy and Primary Education, who, when looking at stories, found that only 4% of protagonists in children's fiction books had Black, Asian, minority, ethnic characters. So it does raise real questions about the way that many children see themselves in the learning and in their world. And we try to make that our, our work at Storymakers to work together with teachers and children to think about um, how we can amplify children's uh, voices, particularly uh, children who are marginalised in those narratives. And we use, um, within Storymakers, we use particularly drama and creative writing, acknowledging that there's many, many ways to work creatively, but drama and creative writing is our particular focus. Um, I'm going to talk about one of our flagship projects, but most importantly, my presentation was Amplifying Children's Voice. And I want to share with you some of the things that young people and children say about our work. 
And I'm going to start with a quote from a girl, with a, girl, with a wonderful girl from year five who said to me, young people want to be heard by adults around the school and around the world. So I'm just going to talk briefly about one of our flagship projects, the Storymakers Press, to give you an example of our work. Um, and this is a, um, a publisher that we have. We work specifically focus on working with children from eight to 12 years old. And um, very much as David and Anton have mentioned here, the focus of this is trying to open up curriculum spaces for this work and meaningful curriculum spaces. Um, so we have published three books. We co-create our stories with children because our research is about co-creating with children. So um, over six drama workshops, we create a fictional story with children. And these workshops are very much about bringing children's lived experiences into the space. They're about creating a sense of belonging and really valuing those stories. Um, and then we develop them into publishable fiction books. And within that process, we use children's uh, drawings, all the artifacts and all of the things that are meaningful for children within that process. And children are part of our process um, right the way up until the book is published. Um, and so um, uh, it's very much about collective creativity. We have published three books. I'm going to mention two. Um, Zalfa Amir is a Warrior was um, our second book created with 15 um, year five Muslim girls in Bradford. It is a, a, um, a retelling of a Kashmiri fairy tale and they've certainly put their stance on it. They've certainly created their own characters there. Um, and then our uh, most recent book is called Chasing the Volcano, which was co-created with nine Roma children in Bradford. And we use a lot of oral storytelling within that story. So we have the books. And in terms of bringing the, um, bringing the work into the curriculum, we also create explorer's guides. And these guides are about taking six moments from the story. Sometimes um, the children bring, obviously, elements of their own experience into the workshops. Um, and we want to give uh, teachers the opportunity to explore those moments in more detail. So the teacher's guides have a, a clear framework linked to well-being. Um, community and imagination and again what we're trying to do is to get to really value creative uh, this kind of collective creative learning not by having assessment outcomes but I act actually su supporting a language where we can recognize this work um, and articulate it so the guides again have a, a, a framework for well-being community and, imag and imaginative freedom um, they take six moments of the explore the moment of, from the story which we explore in detail um, and then they're mapped to things like the relationship curriculum as well so we hope they're a really useful and helpful resource for teachers and they're working progress we work very much with teachers on they're collaborative as well so I'm going to end with a few quotes from children because I think this work is about emotional literacy. It's about ethical citizenship in action. And the most important thing and all the work is framed around what children say, how they feel and what they think they're learning. And I think these quotes speak for themselves. So I'll just end with them. Sometimes when I feel angry, I use my imagination and draw. Sharing the ideas is my favorite part. I feel like my mind's escaped from captivity. I like imagining. I have a big imagination. It's not about characters that look like me. It's about characters that are like me. In story makers, there's no right and wrong. So I'll just end there because I think I perhaps couldn't try and sum up what we're trying to value and put across in the work more than the young people that we work with. Wow, thank you, Lisa. Really powerful. And do we, we haven't done an event yet where the children actually do the talking, but I think there's definitely a place at a Diverse Educators event when we come to Leeds next summer for the children to come and share their experiences that as well. That would be amazing. And we do have a youth panel. So very much, they, um, you know, that would, be, that would be wonderful. And that's part of our festival. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Lisa. And last but not least, Nick, welcome to the panel. Delighted for you to be here. Can't wait to hear about GEC updates. Over to you. Hi there, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm talking about representation. I thought I'd do a little circuit of information to the interior of my mind and uh, then talk to you about the GEC, where, of course, there's information on the partners page on Diverse Ed as well. So if I don't get time to say, please head over to there. Um, thinking about representation, 
uh, immediately reminded me of my decade in the classroom as an English media and film teacher with the re-presentation. And when I was thinking about my students, I was thinking about how we used to talk about the signifier and the signified meaning, what we saw, what we could decode, what we could construct, and how we break that apart. I can see some people nodding, which is good. Um, part of that, I feel, is when we are presented with something, we um, have different reactions, we behave in different ways, and we make different decisions. The last two years, with working with GEC and now starting doctorate, I've been really interested in the idea of bias, and this is sort of the center of my studies. Um, um, because what tends to happen is that the cause can be invisible, uh, but the effect is visible to us all, which is what we see in a positive and in a negative way. When we come to bias, what I didn't realise, it actually comes from quite a uh, long history of twists and turns. It originally came from the Indo-European skier, which means to turn or to bend. Um, in the 13th century, it became known as bias, which was to perceive something or something to have an angle or a kind of cross wire. Um, where in the Greek, it means to cro cut crosswise. In the 16th century, it started to have more of a figurative meaning than just a um, literal one, which was from a game of bowls, which they used to wait, and to have a bias meant it lent to one side. Um, Shakespeare in King John says, commodity, the bias in the world, which is one of the first figurative ways of the word bias. And even then, it was starting to mean a kind of a prejudice, um, an inclination for something, um, a predisposition uh, disposition for, towards something. My studies have meant me, uh, question why we think like this. Um, we, the term unconscious bias, I think most people um, within this community would have heard of this implicit bias. Um, we are know now that the brain gets 20 million uh, pieces of information um, in around a minute, I think it's about 50 seconds. Um, of that, the brain can process about 50 and we understand seven. So the bias that we have, this unconscious bias that everyone talks about, is our brain making mental shortcuts based on our lived experience. If we flip that back around to the children and we look at representation, what I found really interesting is that uh, young children, babies, 18 to 24 months, understand the difference between genders. They're already trying to take in information and make those assumptions. Some studies I've found have even shown that it happens at three months. When children get older, um, we know around three years old, um, the research by Kidsgate, for example, illustrates to us um, that they start to understand those career choices. And on the GC website, we've got on a video wall the redress the balance, um, where we know that if you work with children and talk about careers, that they may have not had it open to them by the end of you know even just a few weeks or even a lesson, that they will start to identify with those. We know representation matters in our books. We know that um, boys are twice as likely to read a book with a male protagonist. Um, but also there's things in bias that happen when we, we, we are slightly older. I heard recently about Google when they first uploaded videos. They couldn't understand why everyone was doing it the wrong way around. But the designers had, had a bias for right handed rather than left handed. So you flip the phone the other way. Um, so these biases, I think, kind of all come together. One of the ways that you see it with slightly older children now, and I did see that um, some younger children might be watching, but if I say the oldest profession there is, I'm hoping people will understand what I'm saying. And I have issues with that, not with the profession, um, absolutely fine with that, but the culture and industry around it. And I think coming back to those, that media slant about representation, we're seeing 12, 13 year old children trying to get rid of their hair to represent things that are actually due to the camera angle of very grown up material. These messages, which are permeating through to our children and they don't even understand why they are, means that we need to step in as educators and as parents. One of the things that we're doing with the GEC is we came together, myself through um, education, uh, with Kat Wildman, my co-founder, with the view that these um, inequalities uh, were, were so embedded we didn't know where to start. So being a bit of a retro girl, I see it as a, a game of kaplunk. I see there's loads of balls and there's loads of straws. And if we take something like sexism or um, anti-ableism, or we look at SES, social economic status, we can see that there's lots of different issues in it. So what we've done, and a short version of this, is we have designed a framework, an app, uh, which we're launching after half term, um, which is for schools, um, which takes you through all of the characteristics, all the training you need and provides you with all the data so you can understand how you're representing yourself to your students and to one another.
Thanks, Nick. Over to you, Benny. I think we've got lots of questions, haven't we, from the audience, and about 10 minutes to pose them. So over to you. So there's quite a few threads coming out, so I'm going to try and uh, address all of the questions as we go and try to direct them to the right people. So Laura Bercy asked, how do we, as uh, or she, as a white educator, better represent black students or minority ethnic students um, without representation from staff? Perhaps uh, David or Anton, would you like to, to speak to that? If I can come in on this first, and Anton, you can follow on from me. Um, what we want to do is we want to try and encourage, in the first place, our young people, particularly those who are in our sixth forms, that um, taking a career in education might be a good pathway forward. Because we need a pipeline, really, of people coming through. And it's it's great to think that somehow people are going to make it through to um, becoming head teacher like myself or even CEO like myself. But it's a long, hard journey. It takes about 17, 18 years to get to head teacher teacher level and so what we want is we want to provide as many opportunities for people to start the journey and then as people are going on the journey to look after them uh, to acknowledge that people with ethnicities like myself often have different barriers to others and so trying to find ways of actually supporting people through that and if they do want to go through to sort of um, the higher sort of um, roles within our um, system that they're not stopped from doing so because of the bias that Nick talks around and other things that are within the system that tend to sort of create glass ceilings or even glass cliffs as I've heard about recently that make it difficult for those people as they progress through. Anton do you want to take over? Yeah um, I really echo what you say in terms of where are we getting our pool of applicants um, from as well? Um, because me getting into teaching, I know it was a very personal thing, wanting to be a strong black male role model in the in the classroom and be somebody that I don't think I had at the time. But in terms of being having that information of where to, to go about to train, and um, it wasn't quite accessible at the time for me. So um, perhaps some form of, I guess, media um, push or um, educators and universities going to the right places to, to diversify that pool of applicants into the job. Because as you said, David, that pipeline um, needs, to, needs to change as well. But um, something else that's important, it's not just about hiring anybody and everybody. Um, there still needs to be a, a quality, still needs to be um, represented well Absolutely. Um, sure, sure. I, I uh, so. Thank you for that. Um, it's a really clear, succinct answers. And following on from that, one of the questions we have from Katie Smith, um, and perhaps um, again, I'll start with you, David, because this is you know your your realm. Um, it, in particular, rural schools have trouble attracting staff, perhaps from Black, Asian, or minority ethnic backgrounds. Um, is there uh, a, a strategy, um, suggestions that we can we can make as a collective to be able to attract a pool of people to those areas that aren't necessarily traditionally um, filled with, with BAME people? Um, well, I work in Cheshire and those people who know Cheshire know that there's not a lot of BAME people around and um, we've got a lot of rural communities as well. One of our schools in our trust has only got 90 children, 93 children I think they've got in the school. It's a village school. And so what we've found is that by having a multi-academy trust, um, the top edge of our trust goes to Manchester. So we have the ability to attract people into the trust. And then once in the trust, we can then have people working more widely across the trust. Um, just as an anecdotal sort of example, one of my PE teachers um, was a, a person from a uh, global majority background. And so we were able to have that person not only teach in our school, but they also did our primary outreach and taught in several schools um, within the town of Congleton. And so we were able to therefore have a bigger impact for the few that we did have. And, and I think really this is the issue. Um, until that pipeline is developed, those that we do have, we do need to try and find ways of making sure that they can impact on a wider area. Absolutely. And it's wonderful to have someone here from that um, from an area where that is definitely the case. So that's a real life example of how practical representation works. Um, so moving on slightly, there's a real strong thread uh, amongst all the panellists about agency and student voice. So I wanted to ask Amanda to start with um, about this idea of agency and student voice. How do teachers get access to the voices of refugee children or Gypsy, Gypsy Roma traveller children? children um, who don't necessarily kind of come up in our in our um, uh, spotlights as often as other children. Um, is there a way of people accessing this information? Amanda? 
Um, the way it happened for me in Milton Keynes was because I run an, uh, an organisation myself and uh, it's a voluntary um, third sector organisation and uh, I've worked very closely with schools uh, having been a chair of governors before and so on and so forth. I've got lots of contacts within Milton Keynes education system and they contacted me and said, look, we've got a batch of these children arriving. What what can you do to support us? So basically we all worked together, the, the education system, social care system, we all worked together. Um, and I, I worked very closely with the Red Cross in Milton Keynes who have kind of taken charge of refugees, if you like. Um, and we, we set up, um, one of the things we set up was an induction and orientation group for families. So it was a holistic kind of thing. And then that led on to I set up groups for um, mums who wanted to learn to read what their children were reading at school so they could read bedtime stories and so, and so on and so forth. So it, it from Milton Keynes point of view, it's a very holistic. We take the whole family and uh, encourage them to make the most of what's available to them. And for those children who are waiting for school places, we have an orientation um, project which um, it kind of gets them into um, makes them Milton Keynesian, if you like, um, and introduces them to all the ki kind of hot spots, the places they need to know about, the libraries, the school they might be going to, and so on and so forth. And then we do an induction into school with the cooperation of that school. Um, and we go in and support. And I've trained a group of um, mentors from Syrian and Somali refugees is mostly what we have in Milton Keynes. So I uh, I've trained a group of those to go into school with the children um, on their first day and, and we make it a very gradual process. Some children can go straight in once they've done the orientation project um, or they're offered a place immediately. But to have someone there who can speak their language and who they can, you know, ask things of at playtime. And so they're not on their own at playtime if, if they're having difficulty setting in. For, me, for us, that's been extremely valuable and continues to be. Thank you. So it's collaboration, basically. Thank you. That's really useful. Um, and we've got some comments on that as well. So the idea of involving parents and community is key. Uh, and those voices from children who are uh, underrepresented, underrepresented in our populations is, is absolutely vital. Lisa, do you have anything to add on that? Because I know that you work with um, Gypsy Roma Traveller children um, uh, extensively. So would you like to add something? Um, I think uh, agency is a really interesting word that's banded around, isn't it? And perhaps there's something around thinking thinking about the way we view childhood generally. And if we view children as responsible choosers um, and they're given curriculum um, opportunities to sort of make decisions and explore multiple perspectives and value those, that's a starting point for thinking about agency. So in response to the question, I'd say um, two things really. To, um, obviously our books and our guides are um, a starting point to bring um, voices into a range of classrooms. Um, um, and I think one of the key things that's been successful about those for those particular children is working multimodally. So using orals, bringing oracy, focus on oracy as well as, as a meaning making process and also um, physical work through the drama because that's about emotions and emotional literacy um, and also um, visual representation as well. So valuing all those different ways of knowing is one thing that I would um, say um, yeah, around agency. And I think that, that that is a starting point. Obviously it's very it's a, it's very complicated, isn't it? Um, but that that they're two things that I would add to to Amanda. And the books and the guides are a, a starting point to open up those curriculum spaces. Perhaps for schools that don't have that um, demographic of children as well. It's a, it's about looking at opportunities to reframe the curriculum differently. What's a different starting point um, around a particular topic that would allow us to look at this um, area of the curriculum and bring in those perspectives and value those perspectives of um, diverse communities. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Lisa. It's really, really clear. Uh, Nick, we have a, a, about a minute left and I don't want to, to leave you out of this discussion. You talked a little bit about um, you know agency and, and the idea of um, student voice in, in, in your session. Um, do you have anything to add? 
Uh, well, I would say that um, one of the things I think with these conversations around diversity, student voices often lacking. So we set up the Smashing Stereotypes website because we felt um, that we're the oldies talking about it. And actually, the young people have a completely different perspective. Um, so we've got smashingstereotypes.co.uk. It's full of examples from children, early years that parents are set in, all the way through to college students, sending us posters from all around the world. So also there's examples of kids, for kids, by kids out there. Lovely. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand over back over to you, Hannah. Well, I want to ask you, Benny, what's, 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 what's going through your mind? What's, what's, what, what are you thinking about? What's your key reflection from this morning? I think it's really interesting when we talk about, you know, we've got some, we've got some clear threads. We've got representation for our children. Um, and we've really got that sense of, you know, you can't be what you can't see. But in reality, the, the practical element of that is well, we're not going to have representation of every single child in, in every single school. Uh, not for a very long time, I imagine. So what we can do as individuals, that kind of onus on us as teachers is incredibly important um, and that and I think student voice captures so much of that but once we know what our children think um, we can start taking meaningful action um, but I think quite often that gets missed you know student voice is the, the fluffy thing that's added on it's a, a project that's given to someone who needs something to do rather than a kind of meaningful part of the school curriculum um, so where schools are looking at student voice I would recommend really thinking about tapping into the groups, the protected characteristic groups, um, and starting that dialogue with them about their experiences, um, because they will come with so much knowledge and so much insight, um, it would it blows people away. And I think my ongoing reflection is, I want to be part of the solution, but have I been part of the problem? I've been in education for 20 years, um, and it takes me back to my deputy headship when I was the white, the only white female um, on an SLT, but we had a very high proportion of EAL speakers, 37 languages, a lot of asylum seeker children, and it, it really makes me think about what could I have done differently in my career? So I think that's my provocation to everyone listening. What can you do differently next week? But what have you done that you could have corrected in the past as well? So thank you so much, all the speakers. An amazing first panel. I've learned so much. There's loads of comments and questions for you. You've all got lots more followers on Twitter, definitely. Um, and we will see you back um, for panel two in 13 minutes time. So thank you very much for joining us.